Anti-Trump is not enough. This week, the Laura Flanders Show comes to you from Berlin, Germany, where in the run-up to the German elections, the German left is saying simply opposing Trump is not enough. The left has work to do too, though, as we'll see. All that and two men from very different parts of the world share their experiences of trying to govern differently from the left. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. Once my daughter, she's now five years old, she asked me, Mama, what does Chancellor Merkel want? And, you know, explaining politics to a five-year-old girl uh, can be a very challenging um, process. And I um, tried to say it in easy words, and I told her, well, Chancellor Merkel wants that everything stays as it is. And ch then my daughter asked me, and what do you um, want, Mum? I said, well, I want that the situation for the million, for the many, will improve. And that's the difference. If we want to solve the problems, if we want to prevent the crisis, the climate crisis, the finance crisis, the crisis of uh, social uh, insecurity, and then we do need change. And we do need changes um, for the many, not only improvements for the few, for the rich. In, in Germany, you now have really problems with a rising um, right-wing um, populism, with uh, rising racism and the rising numbers of um, racist attacks. And um, I am convinced if you want to weaken the racist forces, you have to be very clear and always say no to racism, uh, no to right-wing populism. And um, I always try to explain it this way. The border is not between the different countries or the people with different origins. The border is still be between the rich and uh, the many. And this is, um, if you focus on class struggle, you should be aware that there is no space at all for racism or right-wing populism. And in Germany we have the saying, the boat is full, full meaning the, the, the ship is full, there is no place in a, in a ship. And I am answering, no, we are already all sitting in the same ship, on the same boat because um, our fates are already connected with each other. Finally, the question of climate justice showed us that um, we are um, a community of fate. During the US American election campaign, we were really following the mobilizing eff effect of Bernie Sanders. So, um, who said, um, I'm a socialist, and even very close comrades of mine um, um, visited his campaign for a couple of days. And uh, we, this was really inspiring for us, his way of mobilizing and using um, campaigning instruments and we also used this and um, this um, kind of canvassing for example and um, I was really impressed that he always said the situation for the middle class has to be improved and he connected these topics with the topics of Black Lives Matter, um, of the queer community, so he never made a distinction between the question of social justice and the question of diversity. And this was a very successful campaign. For decades, the younger generation was raised in the mood of post-politics, so oh, whether you are left or right, it doesn't matter, you can choose what you want, you don't, um, I don't care about politics. But with um, the rise of right-wing populism and also with the election of Donald Trump, now more and more um, na um, younger people are really enthusiastic and they become members of parties, which was considered to be very old-fashioned in Germany, but now they are becoming members of parties, of left parties or social democratic parties, and say, okay, 
we want to help to prevent more success for the right wing forces. So, of course, um, I would wish you another um, result of the um, presidential election in the United States, but one result of your election was a rising numbers of young, very active members in the democratic and left-wing parties here in Germany. So the last time I spent much time in Germany, in Berlin, it was the 1980s. This was still a divided city and there was a wall going down the center. Where I am now was in the middle of East Germany, the DDR. Today, it's like this. A lot has changed. Germany is united, but there are divisions still. And for the left in particular, the work remains to create an inclusive, intersectionally conscious left movement. And that's the project they're engaged in now. Issues of race uh, in Europe generally are very complicated, very sensitive issues. The left in Germany has not dealt with it the way they should deal with it. Um, I think there's still a lot of progress to be made um, and I'm positive about this. I think we can make it, but there's ne there needs to be um, a fundamental acknowledgement that they have failed so far. We can't use the word uh, Rasse in, in German. Um, because it is equal to um, speaking about biological racism. So there is no understanding or there's not enough understanding of structural racism, systemic racism, and most importantly, race as a social historical construct, political construct, um, and also a, a very important political tool in order to uh, combat racism at a systemic and structural level. When I speak about racial equality, I include people who would not necessarily be seen as a race, um, but as racial minorities. So I'm speaking of Roma people, Muslim people, of uh, undocumented workers, descendants of migrant workers, most importantly, because generations that have been living in Germany that were born here are still seen as not belonging to the German people. So it means that they are also racial minorities, even if they have white skin. I, I, I really don't think that we need to have simple issues to have simple answers. We can have uh, complex issues and have effective responses if we just um, are open to understanding them. And I think uh, so far what's preventing us from this is the resistance. People don't want to go into this complexity because they know what it entails. And what it entails is changing a perspective that, um, and this perspective um, is bringing more compromises on, on, on one of the sides. And the side is currently the size in power. We don't need to have Trump to, uh, to engage uh, in advocacy uh, for racial justice and, and, uh, and intersectional justice. Um, it means that even in the, in the Obama administration, there were a lot of things to do. Um, so I think uh, the same applies to Europe. So we may not have a Nazi government yet, but there are uh, uh, deep inequalities um, within the German population. Um, it's the same in France. It's not because Marine Le Pen hasn't come to power that we don't have this. There are gross human rights vi violations happening on uh, EU soil. It's not, we shouldn't attach a system to a personality. It's not because a person is not coming to power or because we have a person at the head of a government that is uh, perceived to be liberal that those issues do not happen. The election results will not change my political line and my political um, engagement um, in any way. It means that um, I do not expect um, the election to solve any problem um, just because it's not the AfD or um, a, a right-wing xenophobic party coming to power. Um, so it may be easier to come into dialogue with policymakers. It may be easier to do our advocacy work um, with, um, with uh, one government more than another. But generally our claims will remain the same and we see that despite uh, changes in governments, um, the situation in Germany and in France and in the UK um, hasn't, uh, hasn't been impacted uh, in any significant way. I arrived in Germany in uh, 2014. At the time, the huge influx uh, that happened in 2015 uh, didn't take place. It, was, it wasn't as crowded. I ha also had the privilege of uh, coming to, uh, uh, to Germany with a visa. And uh, my asylum uh, process was uh, very quick. 
but after all, it was uh, you could sense uh, the risks of staying in uh, those mass accommodation places uh, in the refugee camps. My roommate told me that uh, there were like two or three guys uh, saying that uh, this gay person, this homosexual, and uh, uh, planning to beat me up. So he warned me, and then I, um, I, I, was, I actually never uh, had a confrontation with them. So I asked the social workers if I can come to the to the camp just to collect my my letters and uh, stay at friends. A year later, less less than a year later after that, uh, the Shul Emirating Berlin started the refugee project. So I immediately applied because I had an experience before with working with Iraqi refugees in Syria before the war in, uh, in Syria, uh, LGBT refugees. I was uh, just uh, trying to, um, I was working by myself, it wasn't uh, an official job, but I was trying to help them access, uh, like, uh, or encourage them to, to say, to declare their homosexuality to the UNHCR so they get uh, higher priority in the resettlement programs. The whole asylum uh, system is flawed, like it's basic, psychology to, to, to know that uh, if you put people like mass number uh, 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 in mass numbers in like you know in those small tiny places conflicts will uh, will arise so they will uh, they will start uh, like fighting for their queue or to the toilet or to get the food the, the queue to, to, uh, to get the food so uh, those conflicts will start to get bigger and bigger and then eventually we people tend to go back to the mob mentality somehow and then start to unite against groups, certain groups. And uh, of course, the most vulnerable groups are women, children, and uh, LGBT people, queer people. We work with uh, um, LGBT refugees in Berlin, in the city of Berlin. We are an organization, a local organization in Berlin. Uh, we do social work uh, and social assistance and try to find solutions for our clients whether uh, to, uh, to access medical services or uh, social services. And uh, we cooperate with other organizations that have uh, refugee projects as well. Uh, I think our biggest problem now is like, um, um, I keep saying this about Germany, they, once I arrived here, when I arrived here, they told me like, it's Germany, like laws don't change very easily. But because of the <laughs> far right uh, and uh, uh, it, was, it was very easy for this current government to change the laws to, to the wars for, uh, for refugees and make it even more difficult. So I think for us, uh, this is our biggest problem because like, uh, the, I, I feel the message that is being sent by governments now is that, okay, we believe that all of our citizens are uh, xenophobes and racists and anti-refugees, so we're going to make it difficult for refugees to come. Uh, this is the assumption that uh, Mr. Trump is doing in the US and also um, uh, Mrs. Merkel is doing here. I have been working on the Syrian issue, uh, Syrian LGBT issue for a while, and uh, for me it's uh, just uh, maybe a lot more pressure to highlight the, the dilemma and the plight for, of uh, Syrian uh, refugees in uh, Syria's neighborhood because they flee uh, homophobia to a homophobic, uh, two homophobic countries. This is the thing I would, I would want to see from like, just understanding that there are LGBT refugees in, uh, who fled their countries and they are in the so-called transit countries now. And I think those people are in need of more help because you have organizations in each country and each city to help the refugees that are based there. But I think as a collaborative work for all organizations, I think we should pay more attention to, uh, to this uh, issue as well.
In 1990, when Germany was reunified and the city of Berlin came back together east and west, there was a lot of empty property. City officials responded by selling off a lot of publicly owned property and doing away with most of the subsidies for low-income renters. Well, that combination by the 2000s had created a kind of magnet effect for Berlin for property speculators and artists, and gentrification was a real issue. In the last few years, while rents have been soaring and wages have been remaining more or less flat, grassroots groups have responded by putting pressure on the city officials to make real change. One organization, Kotti & Co., in the trendy and gentrifying area of Kreuzberg, sat down and talked with me about how they had forced city officials to respond in a positive way. Here's what I found out. We are in the center of Berlin, a neighborhood, a district called Kreuzberg. It's a former West Berlin district and actually was on the edge of West Berlin. So if you would walk down this street just a, a couple hundred meters, you would actually hit the former wall, the area where the wall was standing. It's a, still a very poor neighborhood. It used to be a very much a working class immigrant, uh, student uh, neighborhood, but also uh, the core, the center of alternative movement in West Germany. As we know from gentrification processes all around the, uh, the planet, it's usually the poor, diverse, multicultural, creative uh, and immigrant-dominated um, neighborhoods which are eventually interesting for uh, real estate investors. And so also this neighborhood has um, uh, received one of the highest uh, uprise in, in rising rents in the last, uh, let's say, five, seven, ten years. We made an inquiry in 2011. We asked about 200 uh, people in this area how much they pay uh, uh, for their rent. And it came out that they pay between 50 and 60 percent of their income on rent, which, because they have a very low income, would mean that most of my neighbors, of these people, 50, 60 percent, would have only 200 euros a month for living. So you can imagine how dramatic the situation was. And this was the moment actually when we started our initiative. So in 2012, on 26th of May, uh, we had a street fair here with, uh, you know, food and uh, children games and uh, some information stands. We built a, a wooden platform out of uh, pallets, uh, these kind of like industrial pallets. After four days, the police showed up and they were like really hectic about the situation because they didn't, you know, you know, they were driving by for days and not seeing us. We were invisible because we didn't wave red and black flags. I don't know. So, uh, so when they showed up, uh, we tried to calm them down, said, you know, look, we've got it all set up. You will get receive a call within, within the next two, three hours and we're going to work it out. This is what happened. So we got, we were tolerated by the uh, official city officials of this district, and then something very, very beautiful happened because this went, how do you say, uh, uh, it went in the media and there was coverage. So in the next two, three days after we started, there were hundreds and hundreds of people all over Berlin stopping by from the neighborhood, homeless people, academics, teachers, schools, whatever, and they would sit down, have a tea with us and chat about the situation. Now we're in the inside of what we call Getsu Kondo, which is a Turkish word, uh, which means built overnight. And we are relating to an old Osman law, where um, you probably know these informal housings in, houses in, in Turkey, slums, they would, you know, informal houses. And uh, Getsu Kondo means built overnight. And you could kind of actually uh, leave the structure if you actually would build a roof overnight. So this is what, how we, what we relate it to. Protest was just the beginning. The beginning was we squat this place, we have 30 demonstrations every weekend, and then of course we have all the social networks in the neighborhood. So the neighborhood is something like the foundation. On top of that we built a lot of our expertise working groups. We did a lot of collaboration with big and smaller institutions in the academic field, in the cultural field. So we started as a group of 10 people here in the beginning talking about three houses, rising rents. Then we figured out, oh no, this is about Cottbus Hattor, this is about 3,500 flats. And then we figured out, you know what, this is actually about the housing question. We should think bigger. Uh, there was another referendum which was very inspiring to us about uh, an empty airport. So we actually started to begin to think bigger and bigger. And uh, this is actually how we managed to change the course of uh, housing policies in, in Berlin. We're 
Wherever you are in the world, being in government is hard. Still, all sorts of progressives and radicals pursue high office. This century started with new people and groups winning state power in countries like Bolivia, where Evo Morales became the first indigenous president backed by a popular movement, Vivir Bien. In 2015, Greeks elected the progressive left bloc Syriza for the first time. This spring, I had a chance to talk with men who served in those administrations about their expectations, experiences, and what they learned about doing governance differently. Andreas Karatsitz served with Syriza, Pablo Salon with President Morales. During the year 2005, uh, Evo Morales won the, the elections. We had a new constitution. We changed our, the name of our, our state. is now Plurinational State of Bolivia, recognizing that we have more than 30 nations inside Bolivia of indigenous people. That was a great, great moment, and it lasted for uh, three, uh, four years. I used to be at the leadership of Syriza for 11 years. Syriza had a program which it was responsive to people's needs. The problem was that we didn't have a concrete action plans. How are we going to implement these policies? I realized at some point that there are several certain limits in what we can achieve if we do politics in a traditional way. We have to take into consideration the complexity of the society, the complexity of being in the government and having to do with state institutions which are bureaucratic in nature, aligned with the interests of the elites for so many years. So you need to have a, a transformation strategy. One th major thing is uh, the um, decentralization of decisions. We are talking about a different model of leadership which is a, a, which a necessary thing for our societies in general. Complex societies cannot be governed anymore by authoritarian, uh, in an authoritarian or hi hi hierarchical way. We have to distribute the decision-making processes and the government could have, and the leadership could be a facilitator of this democratic process because if we do not take in, into consideration and we do not bring in different perspectives, our decision our decisions will be wrong. In the Bolivian case, we began to do things to stay in, 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 in power. Bolivia has always lived from extractivism. Silver, then rubber, then tin, then gas. What we wanted to do was to move to be an agroecological country. We could have moved to renewable energy, to ecotourism, but we didn't do that. The, the, the government continued with extractivism of gas. Th there were no other alternatives, they were. But the easiest one to remain in the government and to get power was to uh, extract more gas, sell the gas, have more income, and of course you can do a lot of social programs and you can have more power. This is a very crucial yeah issue we have to find a way to overcome. We were going to have a conflict with our lenders. The lenders were controlling the basic functions of our society through liquidity and funding and we, we, we should be able to take on uh, as a society collectively to take on basic functions to create degrees of autonomy in order to be able to engage in this fight. We have to appeal to people's uh, availability. People were willing in Greece to become active and engaged in this fight, but we didn't have the, the mechanism to receive this availability and transform it into social power. When the negotiation with the leaders went bad, the, the government, my comrades, transformed the rhetoric from delivering to the people what they need into remaining to power as the best way to serve the people regardless of the content of the policy that we are going to implement. I think that we made a mistake in, in, in the case of Bolivia because when we won the elections the most strongest social force was not the political instrument it was the social movement mm -hmm. and uh, Instead of straightening that, we began to 
uh, incorporate the main leaders of all the organizations into the state apparatus. I think that the strategy is more complicated than what we thought. It's not to take state power and transform the world or, or society, but <laughs> to look for state power to build our counter power, even for the revolutionary leaders that are going to go into the government. Uh, so it is a, a strategy that has to combine uh, two, elements. The two elements, two key elements. And, uh, and uh, I think that maybe this is the way to sort out this, this deep problem that we have seen in many places.